We did all the background kind of stuff the other day. I'm not going to talk about any of this yet. But I will talk about today both of these um, in relation to lawn ball. And we kind of talked, you know, br briefly background stuff about Marie de France and stuff a little bit. So we're not going to do that today. So let's just start at the beginning, page 188. Okay. And notice what we're told at the opening. We're told who it's about, when it's about, and where it's about. Okay? It's an Arthurian tale. It's about King, uh, kind of about King Arthur, but specifically it's about Longball. It's set in Carlisle, which is in, depending on how you look at the border, which in the Middle Ages it was a little fluid depending upon who was defeating who in battle between the, the uh, English and the Scots. Uh, Carlisle, which is in northwest England, so if you were looking at a map where I am, northwest England, England's over here, which is either, you know, Carlisle's northwest England or southwest Scotland, depending upon who's controlling that area at that time. And again, it was a little bit fluid at times. Um, they're there because of the Picts and Scots who come down from Scotland and ravage the northern area of England, what are called the borderlands between England and Scotland. And then we're given the time. It's Pentecost. Okay? The annual feast in the church that celebrates slash commemorates the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles. Okay? Arthur is staying there. Notice, it's not Camelot. When we get to Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, it's going to be Camelot. Carlisle, by Arthurian scholars, um, in popular, hmm, not sure what to call them, popular scholars? Or not scholars, really. Popularist, let me put it that way, of the Arthurian myth. Carlisle is one of the options for where Camelot was located. Carlisle is one, Tintagel on the coast of Wales is another, Glastonbury is another, um, and interestingly, those are all on the west coast. Pretty, Glastonbury is not quite on the coast, but it's pretty close to the coast of Scotland, uh, uh, coast of Wales in England. Another one is Colchester, which is north and east, if you're looking at the map that I'm at, north and east of London. Okay, interestingly, Colchester's Latin name was Camulodunum. Look at the sounds in that. K -m -l -d Camelot. I mean, there's some pretty good evidence that suggests, you know, Colchester was possibly the original Cam Camelot. Anyways, so it's Carlisle, it's Pentecost, it's summertime, Arthurian story. And we get the opening, we get the setting, the background for why Lanval is the way he is. He gave many gifts, line 13. He is Arthur, right? He gave many rich gifts, both to counts and to noblemen, to the members of the round table. They had no equal in all the world. He shared out wives and land among all except one who had served him. Shared out wives and land doesn't mean wife swapping. Okay? It means he allowed the knights to marry certain women and distributes land to them. Probably as part of their dowries. All except for one. Notice, all except for one. That was Lonval, whom he does not remember. That doesn't mean that Arthur's just, you know, forgotten. <laughs> that there's a guy in his court named Longfall. It means Arthur neglects. This is intentional. This is accidental. It's not like, you know, when I'm lecturing along in class and I totally forget something. That's definitely not intentional. He doesn't remember Longfall in his distribution of gifts and treasure. That was Longfall, whom he does not remember, nor do any of his men favor him. That's a benign way of suggesting 
none of Arthur's men remember Longball either. This is intentional neglect. This is intentional dissing, so to speak. For his valor, his curi not curiosity, for his valor, his generosity, his beauty, his prowess, most people envied him. Now, the poet, Marie de France, doesn't state this, but I think it's implied. That is why he's not remembered. His valor, his generosity, his beauty, his prowess. They do what? They envy him. If you're envious of somebody for these traits, what does that suggest? Okay, why? Because they lack those things. They lack valor. They lack generosity. They lack beauty. They lack prowess. What? Totally? No. Compared to Longval. All right? He's, he, Marie de France is kind of setting him up as the model of these things. People don't, don't like, you know, to have, Somebody stands so far head and shoulders above them that they're kind of constantly reminded of their lack compared to that, or compared to that person's qualities. Read Fahrenheit 451 and you'll see. Um, would, you, would you say she's saying that King Arthur envied him as well? I think that's possible. Yeah. It, what is your concept? Let me just. See, and here's where I'm going to get way off. What, what is your conception? What do you know slash think about King Arthur? Anybody? If you think about him at all. If you're English major, you ought to at least give us you know, five he's, minutes of your life. He's like the quintessential king. Like quintessential great king, right? What else? Disney I movie. Monty Python. Well, Monty Python, I mean... I came to Monty Python later in life, but I can't help but read almost everything Arthurian now with Monty Python in the back of my mind. I would love to see a Monty Python version of Lawn Ball. And I'm going to give a couple of reasons why. And it's probably, I'll admit right now, it may be a little risque, but I'll try not to go there too much. Because they would have fun with this. And I should throw out Terry Jones, one of the founding members of Monty Python, was a fantastic medievalist. I mean, he, he knew, he wrote a book on Chaucer's Knight from the Canterbury Tales called Chaucer's Knight, in which he pro proposes an argument that Chaucer's not, Knight is not this great, holy, virtuous, blah, 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 because of stuff that's said in the tales. A lot of scholars don't agree with him, okay, but it's out there. Just like, you know, <laughs> pop culture, totally off the, off the topic. Brian May, guitarist for Queen. Anybody know anything else about him? PhD in astrophysics. And he still does astrophysics. There is just something, I'm not kidding, like three months ago, he published a paper or something. And it's like, pow, out there. Meanwhile, he's out there, you know, we will rock you. It's totally crazy. He was just knighted yesterday, either yesterday or today. So, back to Lanval. Many a one pretended to love him who wouldn't have complained for a moment if something bad had befallen the night. Okay, now that's pretty clear. Oh yeah, we love Lonville. Somebody knife him in the back. If you get him out of the picture, then what? Hey, we all look great. With him in the picture, we don't look so good. He was a king's son, high lineage, but he was far from its heritage. Meaning, far from home. He has spent all his wealth. Notice the change in tense. Previously, it's was, was, was. Now, he has spent. It was spent in the past, and he still doesn't have any. All of his wealth, for the king gave him nothing. The king there could refer to Arthur. He could also refer to his father. That his father gave him a pot of money to take with him. And that's what you have to live on, and now it's gone. Not quite clear which one of those. Nor did Lonval ask him for anything. And again, that could be 
He didn't email daddy, send me some money, and he didn't go to Arthur begging for it. If it is referring to Arthur, then what might that line suggest? He didn't ask Arthur for money. It might suggest others did. So it's another point of comparison, possibly, between Lonball and the other knights. Now Lonball is very unhappy, very sorrowful and anxious. Why? Because he's broke and nobody likes him. I mean, he's, he is your quintessential outcast. So the poet slash teller of the tale, the poet Marie de France is not necessarily the voice speaking the tale, but for this point in time, I'm going to equate them. Because look what the speaker does. Lords do not wonder. What's that tell us? Who's the audience? Lords and ladies. This is a noble audience. This isn't, hey, you shut up back there in the corner in the pub. Or stop the brawl. This is, lords, pay attention. Don't wonder. A foreign man without support is very sorrowful in another land when he does not know where to seek help. That might be a bit of advice from one person kind of living in exile or living in a foreign land. I had written up here the other day, you know, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Marie de France. Marie de France was living in Eleanor's court in England, away from home. She might, might be her way of saying, come on, pitch in. Give me something to live on, might be. Not saying she definitely is. But it is saying, Lord, don't be surprised if a foreigner living in another land is sorrowful when he doesn't know where to seek help. And that seems to imply Lonball doesn't know who to go to for help. Okay? So. He'd served the king well. He gets on his horse one day, went off to enjoy himself. He's going to do what? He's going to try to get away from the things that are plaguing him. Psychologists today will tell you, if you're really down in the dumps, if you're depressed, if you're just full of lethargy, all of which are tied together, do something physical. Go run, go beat a punching bag, get on a horse, go swim, go work, go whatever. Something that makes your body ache. Why? Because it'll take your mind off of your up here problems. And it'll make you think of physical, physical problems. So he gets on his horse. He goes out of the town. He crosses the river or stream into a meadow, dismounts from his horse, leans down next to a tree. And I mentioned the other day, don't do this in Middle English literature. Nearly every instance of somebody doing this, portal to the other world opens, and fairies come in. Fairies, generally speaking, in medieval literature, are not nice, benign, lovable, huggable, wonderful beings. They want to screw with us, both literally and metaphorically. They want to play with our minds, and they want to play with our bodies. Okay. There's one tale, I can't remember the title of it, it's bugging the crud out of me, about a guy who gets kidnapped by the fairies. He's taken to the fairy other world. He stays there a long time, seemingly in that other world, where he's essentially a sex slave for the female fairies of the other world. And he is either released or escaped, I can't remember which, it's been literally 35 years since I've read this thing. It comes back to our world, and it's like no time has passed. Let me take that back. Time has passed greatly here. It's like no time passed when he was over there. It's like time stopped. Okay? He comes back here. Everybody's older. He's the same age. They're like, what happened? And he tells them. So that you get this mythology built around fairies that still exists today. I mean, I'm not kidding. There are people in Britain who follow kind of these rules. You're out 
on a what you know walkabout kind of thing. You're out doing a walking tour, and you go, you're walking through a meadow, and you see a ring of mushrooms or toadstools. You walk around that ring. You don't walk through it. Why? Because that's called a fairy ring. You especially do not walk through that on the spring equinox or the fall equinox. Because those are the two times of the year when the barriers between our world and the fairy world are at their weakest and most open. And it's from those places or a ring of stones, Stonehenge, the rings of stones on Orkney Island and such, doorways, okay? So he goes off, he almost falls asleep, and he looks up, and what's he see? 57, 56. Two maidens coming. He'd never seen any more beautiful. And then we get a description of how they're dressed. Richly dressed, very tightly laced tunics of dark purple. I didn't point out the purple in my first class. Why purple? Royalty. They are ladies in waiting, servants, maidens, whatever you want to, however you want to describe them, to royalty. That means the being they serve, the woman that Lonval is about to meet, she's not just any fairy lady. This is the queen of the fairies. Okay? In some Celtic traditions, Mab is her name, M-A-B. I have no idea where it comes from. So, two of them, one older, one younger. They carry basins of gold. One carries a towel. Why? They're going to wash them. Dirty, smelly, he's been riding his horse. They're going to get him cleaned up before he goes to meet their lady. So, Lonval, who is very well bred, gets to his feet to meet them. Why? Courtly manners. What does a quote unquote gentleman, the word comes from the Middle Ages, what does a gentleman do when a woman enters the room? Stands. Okay? Or gets off the ground if he's lying on the ground. That applies, by the way, for the king, too. Supposedly, any woman enters the room. If Arthur's sitting there at dinner with Guinevere and the scullery maid comes in, he should arise from his seat, even though he's the king and she's a nothing compared to him. Compared to him, get the, you know. So, he rises. And they greet him. Sir Lonval, line 71. My lady, who is most noble, wise, and beautiful, sends us for you. Notice, she's not noble, wise, and beautiful. She's most noble, wise, and beautiful. Most of means you don't get any more than that. Okay? She sent us for you. Come along. He goes with them. He takes, he doesn't even think of his horse. A knight's horse. Man, that's everything. <laughs> you really can't be a knight if you don't have a horse. And he's like, la, 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 following these two beautiful women. They lead him to the tent. They told him the pavilion is nearby. And again, if I were kind of directing a film version of this, I would probably literally have, when they say, you know, the pavilion is nearby, it's not very far off in the distance, over their shoulders, you see this same just thing just kind of materialize. And we get a description of it. And notice we have characters from classical myth slash story slash history mentioned. Why? It's an indication who the poem is meant for. It's meant for an audience who would be familiar with these people with the stories of Queen Semiramis and Caesar Octavius, all right? What is, who does Octavius later on become? You got the, you know, later Augustus, the one who helped defeat Mark Antony, or defeated Mark Antony, I should say. So they get there. Her tent is worth more than any castle in the world. 
There's an eagle on top. Why? Roman, it's a sign of the Roman legion. What else? Why did the Romans put it up there? What's the eagle? What's the eagle compared to a sparrow? A sparrow is food <laughs> to an eagle. Eagle's king of the beasts of the air. Royalty. It's a sign or mark of royalty. Okay? More description of the tent and such. Again, indication or indicating the audience. If you work from sunup to sundown in the muck, and then you go home, which might be just off the field, and you have slop for dinner in a somewhat cold home with smoke in it, because you don't have a proper chimney, and then you go to sleep and you get up and you do the same thing the next day, and you're dressed in essentially rags, pretty much standard life of a peasant in the Middle Ages, is this the kind of story you want to hear? Hell no. This is the story of the one percenters. The 99 percenters, they start hearing stories like this, and you get, where is that reverse? You get the ideas that are discussed in look at where is it in your book you've got a small, small section I don't think I've got it assigned on the syllabus called I don't know where it is it's somewhere right in this area called crises of the 14th century talks about the peasants revolt talks about the church Talks about the Hundred Years' War and some other things. It's only like four or five pages. Read it. It's, it's pretty interesting. Page 211. Okay. Peasants have this stuff that they hear about again and again. You get the peasants' revolt because they're hearing stories of how all these other people are living. Meanwhile, they're living in the muck. Okay. So he finally gets introduced to the lady. Inside the tent, line 93, was the maiden. She surpassed in beauty the lily or the new rose when it appears in summer. So, lily, white, rose, red. Why? Purity, passion. Virginal purity and hot-blooded, red-blooded passion. The reason, you know, red roses are all the thing on Valentine's Day and not, there are, I, I, there is actually a species of black rose. Imagine a guy giving a girl a black rose on, it pretty, pretty much be the death of that relationship. What else? It emphasizes youth. She is in the prime of her life. All right? She lay on a very beautiful bed, and then we get a description of the sheets and how fine the sheets are. Yeah, we're not going to talk about that. Her body, uh, excuse me, she lay on a very beautiful bed, hyphen, pause, whatever, and notice it's in the manuscript, apparently, or at least it's in the transcription we have on the left-hand column. The sheets were worth a castle in nothing but her shirt. Why the two pauses? Because Marie de France is building to the last part of that line. What's she wearing? Flannel nightgown? No, this is a negligee. This is something you'd get at Victoria's Secret, Fredericks of Hollywood, something like that. Okay? Which is telling us a whole bunch of things about this tale. Her body was very elegant and comely. She had on, thrown on for warmth. A costly mantle of white ermine. Who wears ermine? Ladies, any of you been down to the local, you know, Coles, bought an ermine mantle? No. Queens, kings wear ermine. When Queen Elizabeth used to open Parliament every year, she would go in in the full what are called robes of state. The robes were red, and the part that covered the neck, the lapel, so to speak, Ermine, white fur, okay? So she has on, um, 
white ermine as a mantle. Her side was entirely uncovered, her face, her neck, and her breast. See, I've always tried, I've been teaching this for, I don't know, 20 years. I've always been trying to figure out how to visualize this. It kind of implies that she's lying on her side, but I'm not exactly sure where the mantle is worn because her neck, her side, I'm assuming the side of her breast, what else is described? Face, neck, breast, they're all uncovered. So where's the mantle of white ermine actually being worn? To me, visually, it's something's wrong. He goes forward, <coughs> and she calls to him. Notice, he goes forward first, and then she calls him. He's like, oh, man, <laughs> and makes his head, you know, makes his way towards her. He sits beside the bed. When we get to Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, a woman is going to tempt Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. She's going to be described as kind of looking like this fairy queen. She's going to come into his bedroom, lock the door behind her, open the curtain to the bed, because it's a four-poster bed with curtains, because castles are notoriously drafty. She's going to sit on the edge of the bed, and then she, you know, so he's lying here. She's going to plant one arm here and one arm here and lean over him, almost like she's pinning him, okay? That's not what Lonball does. Notice, he sits beside the bed. He's distanced from her, all right? He's not as forward as the woman is in the temptation scene in Sir Gowan and Green Knight. And she says, Lon Vol, handsome friend, for you I have come out of my own land. Now we don't know what that own land is other than we will nearly be told that she's a fairy. We're not literally told that ever in the poem, all right? But she says, I've come out of my land for you. How does she know about him? Is there a neon light flashing in fairyland? Longball needs help. He, we're told he didn't know where to go for help. I've come from afar to look for you. Okay, the very fact that she came means she was looking for him. If you are valiant, and courteous, two hallmarks of chivalry, okay, which we'll talk about a little bit more when we get to Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. If you are valiant and courteous, no emperor, count, or king ever had such joy or good fortune, for I love you more than anything. So he's got to be valiant and courteous. What's, what's another word for valiant? Brave, bold, courageous, okay? Courteous. What does courteous mean? Nice. Thoughtful. Thoughtful. What did you say? Polite. What's the root? Court. What's the root? Cour. See, the court is the heart of society. Right? It's courtly, heartly, courtly behavior. It is the manners and customs that should, big emphasis on should, reign at the court. What kind of manners and customs are those? Essentially, the chivalric code. <clears throat> that is the code of knights. Knigets in Monty Python. What's that code? According to Thomas Mallory, who wrote Le Morte d'Arthur, 15th century, kind of the codified version of the Arthurian tale, every year at the Feast of Pentecost, when does this begin? At the Feast of Pentecost. Every year the knights re-swore an oath. Their oath of loyalty, essentially. It's called the Pentecost Oath. And that oath involved things like protecting those who need protecting, helping the helpless, defending the defenseless, giving aid and comfort to orphans, widows, children. Pretty much 
everything Jesus talked about in the parable of the Last Judgment in Matthew 25, beginning verses 35 and following, gets codified in the Pentecost Oath. If you're familiar with the parable, he says, here's how the Last Judgment's going to work. There will be sheep and goats. The sheep will go to my right hand, the goats will go to my left hand. And the sheep, I'm going to say, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And they are all going to say, Lord, when were you hungry and we fed you, naked and clothed you, thirsty, gave you drink, and visited you in prison? Anybody know what Jesus replies? So King James, in as much, big long word, we don't use that very often today, in as much as you did it to the least of one of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So he's saying, when you did it to somebody else, that was me. When you gave somebody food, standing on the side of the road, that was me. When you did, that was me. Okay? The rest of you, you're going to hell. Lord, why? Because when I was hungry, you didn't feed me, or didn't yeah, feed me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me. Lord, when did we not? And as much as you didn't do it, okay, that whole mentality gets invested into that oath. That becomes the model for nightly behavior. And behavior-wise, that's pretty high standard, right? That applies, that trickles down to interaction with everybody. It doesn't mean all you have to do is give somebody who's hungry food. It also means how you treat other people. The first word you mentioned was being nice, being kind, okay? All of that. So, if you're valiant and all of that courteous. What did Lombard do when the two women first showed up? He got up. Why? Showing them respect. That's an aspect of that. It's placing them before himself. Placing their needs, wants, etc. before his own. Because he was probably pretty comfortable lying down on the ground. So, she says... If you are these two things, oh, buddy, you've got it better than any count, king, or emperor who ever. He looks at her and saw that she was beautiful. Love stings him with a spark that lights and inflames his heart. And people have talked about it, probably inflames other part of his body as well, not just his heart. He says, beautiful one, if it pleased you, that such joy should come to me, that you should wish to love me, you could command nothing that I would not do to the best of my power, be it folly or wisdom. And that is both this and this. Because these are not the same. All right? <clears throat> what she just told her. I am yours to command. See, part of the feudal, F-E-U-D-A-L, system, the whole idea of vassalage, is knights were not only vassals to their lords, they were vassals to their lords' ladies, their lords' wives. That's part of this. The courtly love tradition takes that, and it kind of screws it up. Because it raises the lady to the knight saying, you and I secretly, you are more my lord than my lord is. That is, I will serve you in ways I can't serve my lord. And Guinevere is going to kind of, when she comes into the picture, that idea is going to be brought in. So, he says, if joy will come to me by pleasing you, tell me what to do. Whether, notice, he says, it's folly or wisdom. Tell me to do something stupid. I'll do it. Tell me to do something wise. I'll do it. And that's why, whenever I teach this, Knight's Tale, 
with Heath Ledger and Paul Bettany and several others. It's perfect for this, especially in the scene when, you know, um, Ulrich von Lichtenstein, not his real name, who was a real knight, by the way, the character that Heath Ledger portrays was a real knight who was in real jousts. We have his account of his life, okay? Um, he's gotten really big in the jousting tournament society, and, and that's all real. <laughs> the whole idea about, you know, you've got well, like World Cup tournament, and you've got all these different things going, that's real for the Middle Ages, essentially. The scene where, um, I can't remember her name, the lady's mistress is sent to Ulrich, and she says, if you really love my lady, you will lose every, every joust in this big, big tournament. He's like, what the? If you love her, you will lose. And he's like, okay. He gets on his horse. He literally trots his horse out a few steps in the jousting arena. You got a wall. One guy on this side going that, that direction. The guy on the other side coming this direction, carrying their lances. And he rides out and just sits, stands there. And the other guy comes galloping to full speed. Boom! You know, hits him. And he just, you know, gets bloodied and buried. Why? All oh, for love. Okay? He's got the snot beat out of him. And then she comes back and says, Now my lady says, if you love me, you'll win. He's like, women. Can't live with them, can't live without them. And he starts winning and he wins the overall battle. That's exactly what's being described here. It's folly, if you're a knight, to ever lose. Why? I'll, I'll make a political reference. Some of you won't like it. Some of you will. Because every knight in his mind is Donald Trump. I never lose. I, I win hugely, <laughs> bigly, every time, everything. I'm number one, no matter what. Every knight has that mentality. All right? And then when you're told to lose, that's mm, got to be something big to do that for. So, I will do what you command for you. I will give up everyone. See, he's just shifted entirely from this to this. Arthur Schmarther. I don't care about Arthur. You're everything. I never wish to part from you. This is what I most desire. When the maiden heard him speak, the one who could love her so well, she grants him her love in her body. Love comes first, then the sex. But here it's kind of simultaneously. Now Ron Ball is on the right path. Right? Because what was the path he was on before? Nobody paid any attention to him. Everybody forgot about him. He was poor. Now... He's got the most beautiful woman in and kind of out of the world, if you catch the meaning there. She gave him one more gift. He will never again want for anything, but that he will have as much of it as he likes. Let him give and spend generously. She will provide him with enough. Notice the order. Let him give and spend generously. Giving comes first. Spending's for yourself. Giving for the cost of it. That's for the others. And as much as he spends and gives, his bank account never depletes. Okay? There's possibly some biblical allusions there. Old, one of the Old Testament prophets, Elisha, I think, who met up with an old woman. Her son was her son died. She only had a little vial of oil and a little bit of flour. He revives her son and the little bit of oil and the little bit of flour because he stays with her never runs out. Okay? Feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000, that kind of mentality. Now Anvil is very well situated. We're told. And she says to him, oh, 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 there is a proviso, there is a caveat with my gift. Now I warn you, I command and beg you, tell no one about this. I will tell you the whole truth. You would lose me forever if this love were known. 
you can never see me again or have possession of my body. And he's like, not a problem. Why? This. I put up yesterday on D2L this handout, which I got as a graduate student 35 years ago from a professor of medieval ed. Um, and I already had a, I think it is a list of about 25 of the 100 or so rules of courtly love. Okay? So you can read through all those and kind of go, man, what a screwed up society if they really tried to do these things. This is key. You got to keep our love secret. He said, not a problem. He lay down beside her on the bed. Now, Lanval is well lodged. And if you're like me, you can probably imagine some of the knights in the audience kind of going, yeah, I bet he's well lodged, you know, and snickering. A lot of innuendo going on there. He stays with her. It's neat evening. She says, time for you to get up, go back home. She serves him or has dinner prepared, etc. And before he leaves, what does he discover? Well, it's not like he discovered it. He's given new clothing. Okay? New what's called livery. L-I-V-E-R-Y. Like a new suit. He gets home, and his horse is, by the way, is also, by the way, horse has new harness, new trappings. He gets home. And his men, because he is the son of a king, he does have a small retinue of his own. His men are all dressed like he is. You know, all of Queen Elizabeth's courtiers, knights and such, standing outside of Buckingham Palace and stuff, they wore document, they wore clothing, and on the front of it, anybody know what it had? Big capital E, R, two, Elizabeth Regina the second. Okay? But I think they actually are still wearing those. They haven't replaced those with CR3, Charles Rex the third. Okay? They will at some point. It's going to be a long time before the pound, the, the bills, the $5, five and 10 pound bills, replace her image with his image. He's got all this new stuff. And he goes home, and his larder, his pantry, is overflowing. It was empty before. So that night, he throws a party. Look at what we're told. That night, 203, he keeps a rich table. That is, this thing is a rich spread. Think of the best food you've ever eaten and multiply it. But no one knew where this comes from. There was no knight in the town who greatly needed sustenance who Lombard does not have brought to him and well and richly served. Notice, it's kind of like the parable Jesus says of the guy who throws a feast and invites people and says, ah, I'm too busy, I've got TV to watch, blah, blah, blah. And finally he says, go out in the streets and invite everybody. Lon Bolin has knights looked for who are told um, who are in need of sustenance, food, and has them brought in. Okay? Lon Ball gave rich gifts. Lon Ball ransomed prisoners. Lon Ball clothed minstrels. Lon Ball did great honor. Notice, every one of those things are things Longball did not receive. Not only from Arthur, but from any of the other knights. What's he doing? Going away from this and back to this. He's showing the kind of behavior that should have been shown before to him. Arthur showed this to everybody else, but not to Longball. Marie de France might be, okay, I'm out on a limb here, might be suggesting your beneficence generosity should do what? It should reach everybody. It shouldn't be, you know, you guys are kind of better looking than this riffraff over here. You can have it. You guys eat the scraps. 
No. There was no stranger or dear friend to whom Longball would not give. That old idea we've talked about before, hospitality. But now it's all couched within the language of chivalry, Pentecost, oath, that kind of thing. Okay? Moreover, whenever he wanted to see his fairy princess, queen, I should say, what does he have to do? Just think. That's all he has to do. Boy, I wish she was here. Boom, she's there. In fact, she even told him that whenever, wherever you want me, let me go back, 164, yeah, 163. When you want to, and I love how she puts this, when you want to talk with me, there is no place you can think of where one could have his beloved without reproach or base behavior. Wherever you are. Okay. Base behavior, base, low, common. If you want to, you can probably even go kind of dirty. Using the restroom, I mean, it's common. Everybody does it. That could be what's implied. If you need to talk and you're in the john, give me a ring. I'll be there. But she's going to imply it's more than just that. Where one can have his beloved without reproach or base behavior, that I will not be with you at once to do all your will. So that more implies not using the restroom, but maybe he's even in the middle of the round table with everybody. Because she'll go on and say, and you'll be able to see me and hear me and talk with me, but nobody else will know I'm there. Now that could prevent some problems, present some problems. You can turn and talk to the air and the people in the white coats come and get you and put you in a white suit. So, after we're told how he distributes treasure and everything, he had great joy and pleasure. He can see his beloved often, whether by day or by night. She's entirely at his command. So, a few months go by. The Feast of St. John, not sure the exact date because they're you don't get a gloss for that. It could be August 29th. Um, Pentecost is usually in June. It depends upon the date of Easter. It's 50 days after Easter. August 29th is one of the feast days of St. John the Baptist. It's the beheading of St. John the Baptist. Um, could be that one. Could be another one. What? 30 nights go out to play, so to speak, in an orchard. The orchard is beneath the tower that Guinevere is in. That's why they're there. They know where Guinevere is. That's where her ladies in waiting are. So these guys probably, I could be reading into it, but I don't think so, who are all hunks, they're all hot, both physically and you know metaphorically, um, or literally, probably stripped down to their britches, and they're out there swinging swords and axes and maces and stuff and showing manly martial vigor while the women are looking down going, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm. that's why they're doing it. And Gawain says, oh, we forgot about lawn ball. We should, and he goes and gets lawn ball, okay? So they go back, they get Lawn Ball. So now there's 30 plus one. Guinevere has seen them. She goes and gets 30 of her ladies in waiting. Why? So there's now 30 plus one. In other words, one man for one woman, no problem. Lawn Ball, though, does what? I don't want to do these stupid games with you guys. Why? He's thinking of other games he'd rather do because all he has to do is walk a little bit of ways, get away from everybody else, and he can think of fairy mistress, and she's there. Again, the woods, kind of a base, wild, chaotic area, that's fine place for she and Longball to meet. So... The queen goes down to Lawnball, finds him. 
and says, 267, Lonval, I have honored you greatly and loved you and held you very dear. You can have all my love, so tell me your desire. Now, at first glance, that looks pretty similar to what the fairy queen said. But there's a bit of difference. The emphasis here is more on Guinevere. She's kind of saying, Lanval, vassal, yes, you may have me. I have looked on your loneliness. And emphasizing her highness, so to speak. I am willing to be your lover. You should be delighted. I mean, just that last line. You should be delighted with me. That is, take what pleasure you may. Okay. This, it twists what is already twisted even a little bit more. Because in the courtly love tradition, generally speaking, the woman doesn't make the first move. It's the knight <coughs> who reaches beyond his station that makes the first move. Why? Because when she does that, what is she doing? She's debasing herself. She's lowering herself. When the fairy queen does it with Lawn Ball, what is she doing? She's not debasing. She's saying, you are already at this level. I was going to say, but if the knight does it, he's going over his long. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's why this is antithetical to this. That's why it's adulterous at its heart. This is not adulterous at its heart. Well, just thinking about approach, if you have a knight approaching a queen like that, you're risking everything. Being beheaded. That are like <laughs> everything, yeah. Is that within this tradition, which is why it's been questioned. Was courtly love actually really practiced? Or is it entirely a fiction? And there are some who think, yes, it was practiced, because there are documents that kind of sound like they apply it was practiced. Okay? It was definitely a fiction. I mean, that, there's no doubt about that, because there's hundreds of works that survive that are entirely within the courtly love tradition. Okay? So she throws herself at him. Lonval, lady, let me be. Okay, what does that really mean? Get out of here. That's what that means. In both this tradition and this tradition, Lonval just committed the cardinal sin. Why? You never deny slash reject a woman. If you're a knight. Or, or I'll throw in a possible out. If you do, you do it in such a way that she does not feel denied or rejected. Yeah. Sit down and, you know, try to figure that one out. How do you tell someone no without saying no? Well, that's what this part of Sir Gallon and the Green Knight is all about. A lady tries to seduce him, and he's thinking, I'm a knight. I'm Mary's knight. When we get to Sir Gallon and the Green Knight, you're going to see on the inside of his shield is an icon of the Virgin Mary. And it's like it's hanging on the wall when he's lying in his bed. And this swimsuit model comes out and starts to seduce him. Is she saying, we can talk or we can do more than talk? We can kiss or we can do more than kiss? And he's like, hell, Mary, full of grace. You know, <laughs> help me. And the poet, I mean, literally talks about all that. Okay? So, let me be. Now, that's bad enough. Could he just stop right there? Does that pretty much get the idea across? Yeah, it does. I have no interest in loving you. <sighs> Strike two, you know. Another puncture wound of the heart. For a long time I have served the king. I don't want to betray my faith to him. Way to go, Lonval. Standing up for the code of chivalry. Because at the top of that is your duty to your lord. Just like in the Germanic fourfold epic. Okay? 
I'm not going to be Trey Arthur. While some of the audience would probably go, yeah, but look at Lancelot. I mean, he's betraying Arthur. In fact, some of the Arthurian tales, Arthur knows exactly what's going on. He just chooses to overlook it. Why? Because Camelot would fall apart if he doesn't. Guess what? Camelot's already falling apart. It's built on eggshells. Okay? So, I have no interest in loving you for a long time I've served the king. I don't want to betray my faith to him. Never for you or for your love shall I wrong my lord. By saying that, he kind of gives her an out. It's not you. It's, I've got to serve my lord. Come on, you got to understand it. Please, take the door, walk through it, leave now. The queen became furious. She was angry and spoke wrongly. Okay, twice we're going to be told someone speaks out of anger. I think Marie de France is trying to get a point across to her audience. Don't speak, react out of anger. Bottle it up, hold it in, just chill for a bit. And what does she say? Again, out of anger. That probably is telling us she doesn't really mean it. But she might. Lonval, it's quite clear to me you have no interest in that pleasure. What is that pleasure euphemistically allude to? Sex. Specific women, heterosexual sex. How do we know? People have often told me you have no desire for women. You have shapely young men and take your pleasure with them. Hello, that's unexpected in this context, right? Base coward. Base there means lowest of the low. Why coward though? You could have had me. A real valiant, uh, courageous, bold, brave man would have said, hell yes, <laughs> and jumped at the opportunity. Base, low, coward. Base also means unnatural. Okay. Infamous wretch. He's not infamous yet, but once she's done with his reputation, he will be infamous. My Lord is greatly harmed by having allowed you near him. I believe that he will lose God by it. So what has she just done? What is she suggesting she's going to do? I'm going to go tell Arthur, you're gay. And what will that do? That will make Arthur lose God. And I think what that means is not Arthur's going to lose his faith in God, like he's going to suddenly wake up and go, oh, I'm gay too, and Lonball's my lover, and run up. That's not it. He's going to lose God's favor by having someone like Lonball in his court. Now, part of me goes, Hrothgar could have used a Guinevere. Why? Uther. Could have used somebody to say, you got this guy Uther sitting at your feet. He's a kinslayer. The rot is spreading, you know. But he doesn't have that. Why does she say this? Why does she bring up this charge? There's only one reason why any red-blooded English male would turn me down. Because he doesn't like women. That's it. Why? Because even women like Guinevere in some versions of the Guinevere stories. He says, lady, I know, pause, back up two lines. Out of anger, he said something that he would often regret. In other words, who, what she just said, can't be allowed to go. Why? Because he's defending this. Part of this, I haven't mentioned the word, is honor personal integrity. She has challenged that. He's got to speak. 
but he speaks out of anger. He doesn't speak wisely. Lady, I know nothing about that line of work. I am not gay. I like women, okay? Just lay it out there. But I love and am beloved of one who should be valued more highly than all the women I know. Could he stop there? Yes. Would it make her happy? Probably not. Because what has he said there? The woman he loves, he values more highly than all the women I know. Now, what has he not said about his lover? He hasn't said anything about her morality, her sense of morality. He hasn't said anything about her beauty. He hasn't said anything about her body. He's just said, I value her more highly than all the women I know. Well, a person, don't misconstrue what I'm saying. A man can fall in love with a woman who's not what everybody else would say is attractive. And yet to him, she would be more highly valued than all the other women he knows. Love is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder kind of a thing. All right? He doesn't stop there. He could stop there. Everything would be fine. From his point of view, that is, he wouldn't say anything wrongly other than violating the courtly love part, which is to deny a woman. But he doesn't stop there. What's he doing? He's going to pull out all the stops. Because now he's getting cruel. And I'll tell you one thing. I wish he'd added more. <laughs> And one more thing, know it well and openly. In other words, listen, you stupid. Any one of those who serve her, even the poorest maid, like the girl who empties the chamber pots in the morning, or the scullery maid, is worth more than you, lady queen. Worth more. Now, worth implies intrinsic value. But he explains what he means by worth. In body, her lowest, lowliest female servant has a better body than you do, Guinevere. Face, because you can have a great body and just be absolutely hideous. But nope, great face too. And beauty. But it's almost like those, those three aren't as important as the last two. In manners and goodness. Because what did Guinevere show in this little scene? The woman has no manners. And she is definitely not good. Good refers to what? Morality. The condition of one's soul. He's saying, you're ripe. You are foul. Ripe meaning overripe. Like fruit that's gotten a little bit past, you know, a banana that blackens, an apple that shrinkles up. That's what her soul is like. The queen leaves at once. Why? I can't believe he said that. She's fluttered, you know, flustered. That he had insulted her in this way. She takes to her bed, sick. She's I mean, what's he done? Ooh, he eviscerates her. I mean, just. King comes in. So, honey, had a good day? Comes in from the wood. She makes her appeal. She tells him what happened. Well, she tells him most of what happened. She pulls the Potiphar's wife gig. Lanval came, he made a move on me, I denied him, he said hateful, horrible things. And he tells Arthur what Lanval said about his lover. Arthur gets, rightly so, pissed. He calls his knights together and says, we need to have a trial. We need to have a trial. Notice, it isn't Arthur's decision. Off with his head, you know, playing the Red Queen, Red Queen and uh, Lewis Carroll. Meanwhile, 
back at his lodgings, Ron Mullins returned, oh, fairy queen, oh, fairy queen, dee 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 He's busy to the dog. She doesn't show up. He knows what he did wrong. He remembers the promise he made. He gets arrested. He's brought before the king. The king says, vassal, 363, you have done me a great wrong. You began to base a suit to shame and revile me and insult the queen. Notice what Arthur is suggesting. By insulting the queen, you what? You shamed me. You showed revilement toward me. You say it about my wife, you say it about me. At the top of that feudal system is the king. Beneath the king, ever so slightly, is the queen. Beneath them, ever so slightly, are their children. You don't speak ill of them. So somebody, I can't remember who this was. Last year, when Queen Elizabeth died, during one of the parts of the pageantry, Andrew was work, walk, blah, 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 walking Prince Andrew, Jeffrey Epstein, hookers, underage girls, all that, was walking in this procession, I think this was in Edinburgh, and somebody on the Royal Mile as they're doing this procession, somebody yelled out some rather vile things to and about him. The person was arrested for essentially speaking evilly of the prince. Get on the internet, man. <laughs> and probably had all of it coming, just my own two cents of work. So, you boasted foolishly. Why does Arthur say that? Look at her, man. Everybody knows Guinevere is the most beautiful, honest, chaste, lovable, virtuous, add your adjectives, woman in the world. How are you gonna, how are you gonna support your boast? That your beloved is far too exalted and her maid is more beautiful and worthy than the queen. Lonval noticed, this, denies the dishonor and shame of his lord, word by word. In other words, he takes Arthur's charge and he dismantles it. He responds to it point by point. But what else does he do? Oh, he adds in the part that was left out about the queen hitting on me. And this is said publicly because the knights are around. So now what has to happen? <sighs> now you've really done it. Now he's got to prove everything that he is saying. In other words, he has to somehow prove that the queen said what he says she said. What, what is this a case of? He said, she said. Me tooism. Whatever you think, you know, all men should be, you know, thought guilty of whatever charge is brought. This is a closed room, no recordings, nobody else there. How do you prove? Okay? The proof is going to come up, interestingly, later on. Okay. So he gets arrested, locked up. King asks the nobles, what do you, how are we going to handle this? They say, we have to have a larger court. That is, it has to be the full round table. All the knights are going to determine the truth or falsity, the justice for Ronball. King says, okay. But they also say Ronball should be freed until then. He goes, no, 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 no. No, 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 we need, I need surety, bail. So when you post bail, you get arrested, you post bail. If you skip bail, the person who posted bail is the one who gets in trouble, okay? Bail here means someone stands forth and says, essentially, if Longball leaves, let the judgment fall on me. That person is Sir Gowan or Sir Gawain who stands in for Lonval, okay? Lonval goes off to his lodging. Knights go along with him. They rebuke him. They counsel him, etc., etc. They curse such mad love. 
man, out of his mind, crazy. Only someone crazy for love would say the kinds of things he says. What they really want to know is, who is she? Why haven't we seen her before? Okay. So, the name of day for the court, king and queen are there, the nobles are all gathered there. Some hundred or so. Why? Because he was wrongly accused. They go to sit in judgment. There's talk going back and forth, which we're going to skip. And they tell him, here's how you can be acquitted. Habeas corpus. <laughs> Produce the body. Meaning, if your lover shows up, it's not enough if she just shows up. If, her, if his lover shows up and does what? Is judged by the court to be more beautiful, body, face, beauty, better manners, and goodness than Guinevere. Okay? If they agree to that, you're off. <laughs> you're free. Okay, notice somebody is not going to be happy in this situation. Either Lonvo or Guinevere. So, Lonvo's like, well, I'm screwed because she's not going to show. She told him, you will never see me again. So, the king says, get on with it. She's not showing. Judgment time. Line 469. Why? Because the queen is waiting. What does that mean? The queen is waiting. I've been putting it in real terms. She wants just, well, is it justice or vengeance? She wants her pound of flesh. To use a metaphor from Shakespeare. And suddenly, two maidens come riding down the street. Extremely lovely. The maidens, not the palfreys. Dressed in nothing but purple taffeta. Why purple? Again, royalty. Everyone gazes at them. Sir Gallon, three nights with them. They go to Longball. They tell him. They show him the two maidens. Longball was very happy. No. He was very happy. Line 481. And begged him to say whether this was his beloved. The he? That's Sir Gallon. Why? I'm off. I'm no longer guarantor. Why else is he happy? What is implied, it's not stated, about these two women? Notice he says, whether this was his beloved. There's a pronoun noun agreement error there. This refers to one, these refers to two. This what? There's two women on horseback riding into town. What's being implied is, take your pick, man. Either one of these are better than Guinevere. Nope, not her. They ride up to Arthur. They ride into the hall, up to the high dais. Look at Arthur. Have your chambers made ready, hung with silks. Why? Where my lady can dismount. They've just given the king what? In order. Uh, king, your walls are kind of no, they won't do. Redecorate. Why? Our lady is going to come in here and dismount. It, it needs to be made appropriate. Camelot's a slum for her. He very willingly granted this. I think Arthur's kind of dumbstruck himself. Guinevere's probably you know, hitting him in the ribs with their elbow. He says, okay. They say no more. The king, come on, guys. Judgment day. Oh, we stopped because, you know, these two gorgeous women just came in. We were surprised. So they start talking again. Two more beautiful women ride through town. This time, Spanish mules. The vassals were delighted. They tell Longval. They say, surely. So now we have 
four beautiful women, any one of which, it's implied, is more beautiful, etc., than Guinevere. And even one of these people is named, Yvain, says, surely it is your beloved. <clears throat> Lando, nope, not her. And they're probably going, damn, how good must she look compared to Guinevere? Okay, many people gave great praise to their bodies, faces, coverings, etc., etc. They ride up to Arthur, make rooms ready. Our lady's coming. Go on, little king, go do what we want you to do. He orders that they be taken to the others who arrived earlier. Judgment! He gets back to the point at hand. It's again, you know, he's brought back to reality. Queen's getting angry now, we're told. Line 545 that she was kept waiting. They're just about to make a final decision. When through the town they saw a maiden come riding on a horse, 549, in all the world there was none more beautiful, the lady, not the horse. It can be ambiguous. She rode a white palfrey which carried her well and gently. Why white? White horse would probably throw Guinevere off its back, more than likely. Anyways, it, the horse, had a well-shaped neck and head. No handsomer animal, et cetera, et cetera. Find out stuff about its harness. She was dressed in a shift of white linen, which left both her side, let both her sides be seen. And it was laced on either side. So it like comes up the front, down the back. It's open on the side, but has laces. But you can see skin, OK? Lovely body, long waist, not quite sure what a long waist, anyways, means. Uh, neck whiter than snow on a branch, sparkling eyes, white skin, beautiful mouth, nice nose, dark eyebrows, lovely forehead, curling golden hair, etc. Dark purple mantle, royalty, sparrowhawk on her arm, greyhound running behind her. These are symbols of royalty. No one in the town, great or small, not the old men or the children, who did not go to look at her as they saw her pass. No one joked about her beauty. There is probably an allusion here, it is thought, A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N, to the story of Lady Godiva, who is a real Anglo-Saxon person. I believe she was a queen. Not big queen, but like queen of an area. Who, according to the story, I don't remember... All the particulars, I had to read the story when I was working on my doctorate, it was like 35 years ago, I haven't read it since then. She rode into town on a horse, stark naked. She did that to fulfill, is either a promise or an oath or something, and it was to free her husband or something like that. The people knew, the guy who made her do this, nobody liked it, etc. The people all knew what was going to happen, the people in the town, they went inside, they closed the doors, they dropped the shades, they did not look to maintain her purity and chastity. It's, by the way, where we get the name of Godiva chocolate. It comes from this old myth. Okay? The name does. Or old story, if you want. So, she comes slowly. The judges who saw her considered it a great marvel. Not one who looked at her who did not grow warm with joy. You can do other things with that. Those who loved the night said, this has got to be her. He takes a peek. Thank you. Finally. In faith, it is my beloved 597. Now I care little who may kill me. If she does not take pity on me, for I am cured when I see her. Okay? I care little who may kill me. If she does not take pity on me. If she doesn't at least say, Hi, Lamball. Kill me. Just kill me now. But it's really more than that. He wants her love again. She comes in. Such beauty had never come there. Guinevere, she's been there lots. She lets her mantle fall so that they could see her better. I, I don't know what that actually means. Some critics have said that means she just takes it all off. Take a look. 
They got up to meet her, the king does, because he was very well bred. They look at her well and notice what she says. King, I have fallen in love with one of your vassals. You see him here, it's Lonval. He is accused in your court. I do not wish it to be held against him concerning what he said. What? Concerning what? That I'm more beautiful than Guinevere? Body, face, beauty, manners, goodness? Yes, that. Okay? But also, what the queen said that he hit on me. You should know the queen was wrong. He never asked for her love. Well, how does she know that? She wasn't there. Or was she? Remember, whenever you ask, I will be there. He is alone with Guinevere. I'm just throwing this out. I've literally never thought of this possibility until just now. Did he in his mind go, help me, lady, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and she's there, and Guinevere is here, and she's standing here going, careful, you're going to lose it all, careful. And then Guinevere accuses him of being gay, and he loses it because of anger. What happens? The king says, all right, guys, decide. If he can be acquitted by me, have your noble set him free. And I think, totally reading into it, it's not stated. I think she, if she did let her mantle, showing herself nude, she kind of does this. Okay? Are, is any, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And the guy's like, uh, uh, free. <laughs> and they get on the horse and they ride off to Avalon. Why? Why Avalon? Figures prominently in Arthurian myth. It's where Arthur goes after he is mostly killed by Mordred, his son, half-son. Okay. So they go off, and it's the other world. It's the Celtic fairy world, in other words. Okay, so that was longer than that. It was almost a full time period. So down in the Green Knight, real, real quickly, in four minutes. Not the whole thing, just kind of introduction. <coughs> I've mentioned before, so write all this down if you haven't. Cotton Arrow A10 is the name of the manuscript that contains it. The poem dates from sometime 1375 to 1390. Okay? According to J.R.R. Tolkien, who did an edition of Sir Down and the Green Knight in the 1920s, that is still pretty much the standard edition used in graduate school, if you're going to go on and study something like this in graduate school. The poem centers, or the, the dialect of the poem, you could kind of say fills a diameter of about 30 miles with the city of Chester at its center. That is, it, it comes from somewhere right around the town of Chester in the northwest midlands of England. All right? Part of the literative revival. There are three other poems in the manuscript, the Pearl Poem, Patience, and another poem variously called Purity or Cleanness. I like purity because it alliterates with two of the other titles. Okay? The person who wrote these poems is called one of two things. The Gawain poet or the Pearl poet. Because nobody reads these two anymore. These are just like sheer homily, sermon. These two are great works of Middle English. Sir Down in the Green Knight, often called the greatest romance in the Middle English language. Pearl, the greatest dream vision in the Middle English language. Including, that even includes Chaucer's dream vision poetry. The Pearl poem is head and shoulders above. Allegorical entirely. So down in the Green Knight, not necessarily allegorical. We'll talk about that. Okay? It's composed of these three elements, or motifs, if you want or structures, a beheading game, an exchange of winnings game, and a temptation or seduction game. It begins with the beheading game, which leads to the exchange of winnings, and the exchange of winnings and temptation game happens simultaneously. 
But all three of these are woven together. Because when we get to the end of the poem, we're going to come back to the beheading day, which is going to be linked to the temptation and seduction, which is going to be linked to the exchange of weddings. Okay? So these three things interweave. The name is going to come up late in the poem, very late, like last hundred lines or so. The name of the Green Knight in his regular human stature, nature, not green, is going to be given as Bertrelac du Hort Desert, H-A-U-T-D-E-S-E-R-T. -E and it's either do or dead, okay? The name means, literally, the name means Green Lake, Verdi, like Verdi, Verdigroff, Green Lake by the High Desert. So a lot of early scholars tried to locate the action of the poem near a lake, a green lake by a high desert. Well, this area of England is near what's called the Lake District. A lot of lakes and high moors. It could be anywhere. It's fiction, folks. It's not real. Okay. Um, two questions, one question. Why green? Why is he all green? Why do we say someone is green with envy? Where's the phrase come from? I've never studied that. It's something I need to look up. But in British Celtic mythology, in symbology, you have what's called the green man. You can't go to an old church or cathedral in England and find an image of a face surrounded with leaves and twigs and sticks. Sometimes it'll be above the arch that leads into a church on a door. Sometimes it'll be behind the high altar. Definitely you'll see them in ceilings in what are called the bosses. Just look up green man image. Google it. You'll come up with tons of them. I can put a bunch up on um, D12. Okay, we'll stop there and we'll get into, we'll get way into it on Tuesday. Read through the second fit. That's half the poem. Okay. I'm going to put up today a quiz that will go over the background of the Middle Ages, Lawn Ball, and the first two fits of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. It won't be due until Wednesday night at the earliest next week. So you don't have to take it immediately. I also need to talk about papers. <laughs> That is, there's a song called Lady Eleanor by this man Lindisfarne or Lindisfarne. Lindisfarne. I mean, it's Holy Isle. It's an island, Holy Isle. It's an island off the northeast coast of England. Yeah. There's a song that they wrote it about Lady Eleanor. So I feel like it may have something to do. But that, do you know? With this or with Lawn Ball? With Sir Gavin the Green Knight? No, with Lady Eleanor, we talked about her. I know her. Yeah. Oh, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, anyway. Okay. I just, I cool. just thought yeah. of that, though. Because I was like, I said, the majority of this wasn't bad. But, like, there's a couple questions where I was like, oh. <laughs>